As you know, there's a, an overt movement in our country based on the distorted vision of, a, of many political figures involved in government, like, like the ACLU, other leftist organizations supported by the liberal media, to make America into a socialist, big government, limited freedom, anti-life, anti-marriage, and constantly forcing us to constantly apologize for our Christian heritage. Congressman Ron Paul's vision is to take America back by restoring freedom, our personal liberties, and our nation's core values. <clears throat> Individual responsibility, the sanctity of life, marriage, and, Christian, and our Christian heritage. This vision continues to grow across all of America. In the year two, in 2012, one vision of America will win, and the other one will lose. The countdown determining our nation's destiny has begun, and many of us have been anticipating this for some time now. The threats to American sovereignty, to life and liberty, and to the foundational institution of the family loom over this year. By the end of 2012, we could be surrounded by dark clouds, and we could finally see the sun beginning to shine. The choice is ours to make. Republican voters want a solid conservative candidate who can take on and defeat President Obama in 2012. The key word here, of course, is conservative. So let me leave you with this final thought before I introduce our speaker. When the people fear their government, there is tyranny. But when the government fears the people, there is liberty. Would you please stand and welcome Congressman Ron Paul, President of Canada. <laughs> to go after Obama, and I do my share of it, but I, I think of our problems as much more and much uh, more complicated than just what has happened in the last three years. And uh, so in, in many ways it's unfair to say, well, the unemployment problem is all is Obama's fault. But I agree that he didn't do much to help and sort of like this, but I see things in a much bigger way because I think what our country faces is a crisis that has been ongoing for a long time. We've been slipping and sliding away from the true intent of what our republic was supposed to be like. It's probably a hundred years. We're, we're, for instance, we're, we're following a foreign policy. It wasn't devised by Obama. It wasn't devised by Bush. And it, it was devised actually all the way back to the progressive areas, a Woodrow Wilson foreign policy of making the world for making the world safe for democracy. And look at what's happened in the last hundred years. And I'm trying to talk about foreign policy and other things to change what we have because we don't need this foreign policy of imposing ourselves and forcing ourselves on the world. We need a foreign policy of non-intervention, of peace is what we need. We need to start bringing our troops home and saving a lot of money a lot of lives. So often the people are promised by various candidates that they're going to uh, be struggling and working hard for peace, and then they get in office and they do exactly the opposite. Matter of fact, uh, I sort of like the uh, campaign promises of the year 2000 when George Bush was running, because he criticized uh, uh, you know, policing the world and uh, nation building, in involvement in the internal affairs of other nations. 
but look at what's happened. And, uh, and then we thought Obama might help us and, and get us out of some of these messes. But now we're in more countries than ever. And they, they keep adding. We can't even keep track of how many places we, where our, our troops are. There's probably 900 bases around the world if you count all the big ones and all the little ones. But how many, how many wars are going on? The war in Iraq is really not over with. That, that is still a mess. And the, and the total result of that Iraq war was that we literally took a, a messy country and probably made it much messier now. We have a country, all the Christians were run out of the country, and it was a civil war. We stirred up a civil war between the Sunnis and the Shiites and turned the country over to the Shiites. And guess what? They're close allies of the Iranians. And uh, so all these good intentions or this pretense of good intentions, there's so many downsides, so many uh, unintended consequences, and unfortunately too much blowback. And that's why we need to change the foreign policy of this country. But in, the past, in the past 10 years, uh, the foreign policy expenditures and the wars that we fought have added $4 trillion to yours and my debt, to the people's debt. And this, this is what we're facing. You know, it used to be said, and I said it quite frequently, and you'll still hear politicians say it, we can't do this any longer because we're going to leave this debt to the next generation. But you know what? We are, next, we are the next generation. Right now, you and I and everybody in this country is suffering the consequences of prolonging and postponing the payment of excessive spending. A country that is very wealthy can get away with that for a long time. And we got away with it for a lot longer than the average country because the world accepted us as the issuer of the reserve currency of the world. After World War II, our dollar was very, very strong. We had uh, essentially most of the gold in the world. And we thought we could spend money forever and, and always back it up by gold. And, of course, that broke down. In 1971, we had printed so much money, the gold standard was totally rejected, ushering in this age, this 40-year age, of runaway spending and uh, borrowing and also printing press money and uncontrolled Federal Reserve that has financed uh, the, the, these expenditures. But we, we need to address that subject because if we don't, uh, this will totally deteriorate. You, you just can't, can't do this. So we have been spending excessively, and now our national debt is about $16 trillion. Last week, it was raised, actually, without a, a vote of the Congress. And, you know, because of that chaos last summer, they said, well, it's, all the president has to do is ask for an increase, <laughs> and, if the pre and if the Congress doesn't, uh, you, you know, declare and, and revoke it, the debt will go up anyway. So Congress, you couldn't pass, it, you, you know, you couldn't cancel the debt, the debt request in the Senate because they're Democrats. You did get a vote in the House, and they said, no, we're not going to raise it, but, so it doesn't go up. So the debt went up $1.2 trillion automatically. And uh, it, it, it's, it's on autopilot is, is the problem. And then when you talk about these cuts, the cuts are just all fiction. They, they talk about, well, we're, the Congress couldn't do it, so they turn it to the Super Committee, because they figured the super committee could make a super mess out of it, and they did. <laughs> it's a super mess because they said, well, okay, they couldn't do it, so there was an, going to be an automatic cut of $1.2 trillion over, over the next 10 years. But the, the, the cuts don't start until 2013, and it's over a 10-year period, and all they're cutting is a $9 trillion proposed increase and cut it back by a trillion dollars to make an $8 trillion increase, and they call that, that cuts. This is why I'm trying to bring, back, bring people back to reality and say if spending is a problem, you have to cut real spending. So I have proposed that if we're serious about this, we ought to cut a trillion dollars out of our budget in the first year. But this, this can't be done unless we uh, in this country, the people in this country, uh, reassess what the role of government ought to be. Uh, the, the colonists didn't like the role of the king, so there was a, a little revolution, you know, went on, and uh, we got rid of the king, and they wrote a constitution, and, uh, a very good document, but uh, even then, they, uh, the uh, founders warned that it, it could, you know, there's nothing that guarantees it, only the people can guarantee that this will last. 
They gave us a republic, but they said that uh, the biggest danger is they could morph into a pure democracy where the majority can dictate over the minority. And, and that's, that's essentially what we have today, uh, that the majority can vote, and, uh, and they have been doing this. They've been getting away with it, but now they can't do it anymore. Uh, the, uh, we, we have consumed, we, we've maximized our debt. We owe 16 trillion, uh, 3 trillion overseas, and, and our national debt is 16, uh, 16 trillion dollars. And uh, the borrowing, uh, we can still borrow to a degree because there's still some trust in the dollar. But if we depended on borrowing, interest rates would go up, and that would make everybody very nervous, and the Federal Reserve would be awfully nervous because they think they're they are the king makers and they can do all the economic planning. So they uh, they just print the money, and as long as there's trust in that, that'll work. But the trust is running out, and that's why we're in the middle. We're not anticipating an economic crisis. We're in the middle of the crisis right now. Started four years ago, and there's really no improvement. Even with these GDP figures that just came out, they were much lower than anticipated. But th those figures are deeply flawed, too, because if government spends money, let's say they borrow or print money and spends it, that boosts up the GDP. So uh, just because they print money and build more weapons, they say, oh, the GDP went up. But it doesn't help the people. The people end up with the debt. So this is why this is a very, very serious problem. And so we, we have to decide, especially the younger generation, new generation will have to decide what kind of government we want. Should the government be what it was intended originally there to protect our liberties? That's what it should be. It shouldn't be any more complicated than that than having a federal government designed to protect liberty, provide for strong national defense. And you know what else? Give us a sound currency. That's what we could use right now. But we have we have gotten in this mess because we have not followed the Constitution. If we wanted to clean up our mess, all we'd need to do is send only people that, to Washington who knew and understood and took their oath of office seriously and obeyed the Constitution, I think we could be out of this mess in a year and everybody would be back working again. But that, that is the big problem, is, uh, is getting people to live within the confines of the Constitution. If you look at uh, the various things, there's, there's uh, no, no authority, there's authority and a requirement for a strong national defense, but not to be the policeman of the world, not to get involved in every battle in the, in the world, not to go to war without a declaration. Just think if, since World War II, if we had never gone to war without a declaration of war, how many lives and how many tragedies would we have prevented just by obeying the Constitution and not permitting our, our presidents to go into war without a declaration of war? That's one thing that I would I pledge, and everybody knows I will live up to my pledge. I would never go to war without the permission, the proper permission from the people through the Congress. If war is necessary, then the war should be fought, won, and gotten over with, and then we should come home. That's the way it should be done. Well, we have to decide, is, should we have a system that uh, believes in entitlements from the cradle to grave and that we're supposed to be the policemen of the world? If we have to do those two things, you have to keep doing exactly what we're doing until the whole thing comes down on our head. And we don't know whether that's a year or two or five from now. But it's impossible to keep doing this. If we could maintain what we have today, that is, that the United States government gets to print the money and spend the money overseas, buy cheap goods, and just run up the debt, none of us would have to work. We would just, you know, print more money and buy whatever we needed. So everybody knows that's, that's going to fail. And that's what's happened here in the last few years. It, even in the last six months, there's been a big change. Uh, compared to four years ago and, and what, what's going on now, the American people know the crisis has hit. It's major. We're not getting out of this mess. The jobs aren't available, and people are deeply concerned. Uh, fortunately, though, it isn't like we have to invent anything new. 
if we just just followed our traditions, the understanding of the rule of law, protecting liberty, protecting property rights, protecting civil liberties, we're not in our government is not doing a very good job in protecting our civil liberties. If you look at what's happening today, and I am uh, amazed at how many people are aware of it because I think everybody's lackadaisical. But just take for instance the National Defense Authorization Act and what was in that bill, which should have never occurred, and we really need to repeal that portion that allows the U.S. Army, the military, to arrest American citizens be held without trial indefinitely. This is what's happening. We have a president now that a year ago declared that uh, it is a proper position of the U.S. government to assassinate American citizens without charges. He said, well, they said, well, he's a bad guy. He was associated with bad people, and he was talking about this and that. But no more than that. That's, and Olaki got assassinated for that. His son, who's 16 years old, got assassinated as well. And so the point about how bad a person he was is irrelevant. It, the system is there to protect all of us, so we're never hauled into court and treated like that. And then they march along and they give us this deal that we can be arrested and denied an attorney and put in a secret prison. This is, this is very serious because if we don't straighten up our economic mess, there will be more, more problems and more violence, and, and we have to be concerned about that. So what, what should we do about this? I say what we're doing already is very good because the people are waking up. They're sick and tired of it. This is why people are, are spe speaking out like with the Tea Party movement and Occupy movement. People know there's something wrong and they're not very happy with the two major pro parties and they're looking for something different. Fortunately, America has great traditions, and we only need to look at our traditions. Unlike when the Soviet system came apart, their traditions weren't quite as good, and they've gone through quite a bit of turmoil. But eventually, their system came apart. We didn't have to fight the Soviets. But our system, our empire, is, is going to come apart. So I would like to do it sensibly, come back, work our way out of this, take care of the people who are in need. But if we continue to do this, we will come home, but it will be very, very chaotic. And that is what we have to try to prevent. One of the biggest issues I've talked about over the last 30 years, I first went into politics in the 70s, has been the monetary issue. If we were going to insist that we obey the Constitution when we go to war, we ought to obey the Constitution on the monetary issue, which would prevent so much of this deficit financing. It's very clear, only gold and silver under the law is to be legal tender. You can't emit bills of credit, which is paper money. There's no authority for a central bank. You know what that means? That means we need to do something about the Federal Reserve System. That is true. <laughs> the very least, what we need to do is have a full audit of the Federal Reserve, and because they can create trillions of dollars, which they did in these last four years of bailing out their friends and buddies. And they do this trillions of dollars, much more than the Congress even authorizes and spends. TARP was peanuts compared to what the Fed did. They, they were uh, working with uh, credit up to $15 trillion, half of it probably in Europe, but we don't have full audit. Can you imagine that a secret group of people like this can see it and create this much credit and take care of their friends? At the same time, the Congress, which is supposed to be in charge, can't even get a full audit of what is happening. I think what would happen if we had a full audit, the American people would be so outraged that we would have a new monetary system. But we will have to get a new monetary system because this one is not viable. Nobody really believes that all you need to do is print pieces, take pieces of paper and print numbers on it and, and, it, and it, it's, it represents money. Now they don't even print the paper, they just use a computer. Uh, so that, that will come to an end, and, and uh, the, big, the big job is, is what are we going to replace it with? So we, we need to define that, and to me it's personal liberty. This is what the country is all about, and, and that is that we were endowed by our Creator by, uh, uh, with, with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and life, liberty. It comes from a Creator, or it comes in a natural way, but it's, it's our life and our liberty. We should have the uh, right to keep the fruits of our labor. 
I think if we had that, just those basic fundamentals, you own your life and, and you own your liberty, as long as you don't hurt or steal or rob people or use the government to do your job for you. And then you ought to be able to work hard, have the incentive, and then keep what you earn, which means that we'd have to challenge the 16th Amendment, because I don't think it's a very good amendment. And that means that we would, up until 1913, we didn't have an income tax, but we had a very small government. So if you want a big government, you have to have an income tax, you have to have deficits, you have to have pretty press money until it falls apart. But if you want a limited government is what we had, I think uh, then your, the tax burden would be much less. But the other thing is, is, is the jobs. Where are the jobs going to come from? Why, don't, why aren't there jobs? We have to understand the business cycle. The recessions and depressions are a consequence of the bubbles created by the Federal Reserve. They create artificial credit. And credit is, credit is uh, something that is supposed to come from savings. In, in a free market system, you work hard, you spend a certain amount to live on, what is left over becomes capital, you reinvest it in machinery or business or loan it out. And that guides all the investments and in, in all the decision making. But for decades, we didn't save because we could print money and the Fed kept interest rates artificial low, deceived the businessman and the consumers and all. Oh, there's a lot of money out there. So they overbuild, blow up the bubble, and much of this goes into higher prices rather than increased production. So it did work for a while. The effort was to give a house to everybody in the country. And that's a good motivation. I don't think it would ever work. I think if you want the maximum number of houses for the maximum number of people, you have a free market economy. But if the goal is is just to work a system where even people who aren't qualified get to you know, buy a house even though they can't pay for it, then you run into the problems that we have. The motivation was to give houses to people. But who made the money? The, the people that ran the mortgage companies, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and other mortgage companies, the, the builders and the bankers who traded these derivatives, and they made bundles, billions and billions of dollars until they went bankrupt. But instead of allowing the market to correct it, which means debt needs to be wiped off the books, the people who overextended themselves should go bankrupt. But instead, they got the bailouts. They come crawling to the Congress, Congress gave them tarp funds, they go to the Fed, and Fed secretly bails out these people who have been making all this money. And what happened to the middle class? The middle class, so many lost their jobs, and jobs aren't available, and they're losing their houses, and we're in, into this mess. So the system, the system is very biased against, uh, against the, the middle class. Last night, even in the debate, I was able to bring up the fact, we did talk a little bit about housing, that uh, the, the, the whole housing program uh, is, is you, you know, brought about principally by the, the Federal Reserve. But the middle class is undermined just because of the monetary system. If any country systematically undermines the value of a currency, uh, the middle class will shrink and wealth will go from the middle class to the wealthy class. And if you look at third world nations, and uh, now that we're moving in that direction, we're start, starting to look that way. That uh, the middle class is getting much smaller and the jobs aren't there. And we have lost our confidence in the free market. And uh, we've, we've had this obsession with the saying that the government has to plan everything. And the strongest and most powerful planners are, is, is the Federal Reserve System, and they mess things up. But the good news is, a lot of people have discovered this. They realize that monetary policy is important. First time in a hundred years, the American people are waking up and know how important monetary policy is. And this is this is a, an opportunity for us, you know, to at least present the case for sound money. The founders believed in it strongly. That's why they put it in the Constitution because they had, had runaway inflation with the continental dollar, and they they did not want this to happen again. Uh, but it's happening again, and, and we're going to have to deal with it. If we don't do it gradually, a uh, crisis will come, and this will be, be much worse. But we have to understand, basically, the, princi the principles of liberty. Liberty comes to us, as I said, in, in, a, uh, in a natural way. But it means not only economic liberty, of you being able to spend your money and, and get a job and do these things and run your life, but economic liberty and social liberty is one and the same. You can't have 
economically at liberty sitting over here and one group of people say, oh yeah, we want free markets, but we want to regulate people's personal lifestyle and what they do with, uh, uh, with their religious values and these other things. Liberty is liberty. And if we saw this, actually, when you understand this, this brings people together because it isn't the issue of how you lose your, use your liberty. You want to get together and say, let's protect liberty because I want to use liberty for some of my religious values and some people would use it for different religious values or no religious values just so they get to make their choices. Same way with money. Some people want to consume and, and spend their money. Others want to save and invest. But everybody would get to make their own choices. But, but today there's, there's so much government intervention. The assumption is made that, yes, you can have your religious liberty and you can have your intellectual liberty, but when it comes to putting anything in your body or in your mouth or in your lungs, you can't do it without permission of the government. And, uh, yes, a lot of harm can come from people who don't use their liberty properly. properly. They, they might uh, not, not have a spiritual life, and that might, to some of us, be a dangerous thing. They might uh, not, not uh, enjoy an intellectual life. But some people will make mistakes, but they suffer the consequences. When the burden is placed on the government to run people's lives and to run the economy, when the politicians and the bureaucrats make mistakes, it affects all of us. And this is, the, this is what is happening today. We depend so much on the government to make these decisions, and we suffer the, the, the consequences. So we, we need to reassess all these values and think about what the concept of liberty is all about. Freedom, actually, you know, is something that hasn't been tried all that much throughout all history. There's bits and pieces put together, but probably the best test of liberty was here in this country. And we had the maximum production ever, and the, ma the largest middle class ever. But right now, you're inheriting a system where the middle class is getting smaller, and the pie is shrinking, and the clawing away of the special interests are, uh, in Washington are getting more vicious about who's getting what's left over. And we need a system where the pie gets bigger and it's distributed through voluntary means and creative means. But we cannot maintain these wars overseas and uh, saving the, the money that we need to save, we should start with overseas. That should be the easiest place in the world to cut the spending. All these wars going on, it's getting into trouble. We should be bringing these troops home and having the troops spend their money back here at home rather than in Japan and Korea. <laughs> now, a lot of people question some of my uh, ideas on foreign policy. Uh, not that they should question me, they should question the founders and our traditions. But uh, they, they keep thinking that uh, you, know, you have to vote every single penny for the military that it's asked for. And I don't equate military spending with defense spending. Defending our country is one thing. Just to build bombs and weapons and drones and brag about being able to hit any postage stamp spot in the world is not a good way to, you know, uh, to, to spend our money. But where I really am pleased is the fact that if you look at the active military duty, they donate more money to our campaign than all the other campaigns put together. You know, our, our personal liberty is under attack not only because of the uh, post-9-11 atmosphere and this whole idea that uh, we have to, uh, you know, give up on our Fourth Amendment and we all are subject to searches without, without search wardens, warden, uh, warrants at all. But giving, giving up, uh, you know, like the, four, the Fourth Amendment, that is essentially what the Patriot Act did. It, it demolished the Fourth Amendment. I don't, I don't believe for a minute that we need the Patriot Act to keep us safe and secure. We've got to refuse the Patriot Act. But we need to uh, work rather rapidly because I see a day coming in the not too distant future where we will be challenged. And this is, this is the reason I think this campaign obviously is very important. Uh, the, frequently I will be asked, well, does this mean you think, you know, next week or next month or next year, you know, everything is going to be done for you? No, I don't think that at all. But in fact, I'm pretty much of an optimist, mainly because people are starting to realize the problem. You can't correct problems unless people recognize they have a problem. And this country is recognizing they have a problem, so I'm very optimistic. 
And I'll tell you one other reason why I'm optimistic for, for a couple of reasons. One, young people, the college people, the people under 30 know and understand this and they're studying it and they're understanding it. And I believe that generation that you belong to are going to do what you need to do to preserve our liberties in this country. I talk a lot about the young people and the enthusiasm that we get. We obviously get uh, more votes than anybody else from the younger generation. But I don't ignore the other part of the age spectrum. Uh, every once in a while they could, you know, uh, kid me about my age. But, uh, you know, I think they asked me about that last night. But, <laughs> but uh, now the, uh, the, there's another group of people that I've been uh, aware of, and it also reminds me of uh, some Bible stories about the remnant. In society, there's always a remnant of people who hang around and know the truth and keep the truth alive. And I think so often of Solzhenitsyn, Solzhenitsyn in, in the Soviet Union. He was born, I think, in the year of the Soviet takeover. And just think of how horrible that system was, how authoritarian it was. But he lived behind the Iron Curtain, learned English, learned the classics, and, uh, and, and became a religious person in, a, in an atheist country. And he survived all that, but he, he kept some values together in spite of all that. In this country, this has been true, too. Um, since the 30s, and it, it, you know, even from that progressive era, we changed our foreign policy, our monetary policy, and the welfare policies. Yet there was always a, a remnant of individuals. There was one group that I came in contact with, uh, with that gave me a lot of hope when that was kind of the foundation for economic education in New York, uh, in New York and Irvington. But it was a small group of people that kept alive these ideas. And that remnant of people now is enlarging with the youth movement plus the remnant. So often a remnant is quiet, nobody knows who they are, and it's big. It's always bigger than anybody can imagine. But what I am witness now is the remnant is huge. It's growing by leaps and bounds. The young people are joining uh, in this effort. And there's every reason to be optimistic about what's happening. So I encourage all of you to continue. Uh, I forgot to talk about the campaign. I'd like to get your vote next week or so anyway, too. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes those uh, individuals in the media will frequently say, oh, you don't even want to run. You don't want to win. And all this, uh, uh, you're just running to promote idea. Well, there's no doubt I'm running to promote ideas. But the best way to promote ideas is to win elections. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> they, they just find it unusual to have a politician who is actually running to, to be elected that has some ideas. <laughs> so, but anyway, I want to thank you very much for coming out. I enjoy being here. I wish we had more time to spend, but we are going to spend some more time. But uh, like, like I say, be encouraged, contribute. You have an obligation. If you endorse what uh, I'm saying or have an, even an inkling that you agree with this, the burden is on your shoulders because it falls on you because there's only a small elite group in society that takes it upon themselves to promote ideas and to promote the right set of circumstances to promote the truth. But that small little group will change history, and right now I'm optimistic about that. Thank you very much. Uh, folks.